as I wanted my list to be as inclusive as possible, I've included a number of Lifetime movies and Fatal Reunion is the lowest ranked. As usual for this type of film, we get an opening murder sequence with a mysterious figure in a black hooded outfit offing some poor woman, so nothing too original to start off with. After that, we're introduced to the main character Jessica, who is played by Erika Ileniak, to satisfy the requirement of having a relatively well-known B-movie actress as the lead. Jessica is unhappily married, of course she is, and believes her husband Russell may be cheating. So in typical lifetime double standard fashion, Jessica reaches out to an old classmate named Marcus Declan via an online reunion site. Anyone who's ever seen a lifetime movie knows such situations never end well, and it isn't long before Marcus comes on to Jessica, and after she rejects him, Jessica starts receiving harassing phone calls in the middle of the night. Fatal Reunion is a slow burning movie with almost no interesting scenes in the first two acts. This isn't helped by the director including weird scene transitions and for some reason the camera keeps panning off to the side, often to uninteresting pieces of scenery or up towards the sky. And we're talking about nearly every transition here which becomes flat out annoying after a while. Rare standout moments of Jessica practicing martial arts, which will obviously become important later on, and finding herself on the wrong end of a loaded crossbow. What do you think you're doing? After that, a family dog that we've hardly seen is poisoned and the two children get completely forgotten about later on as well. But things do really pick up towards the end and the exciting drawn out climax is the main reason for including this movie on the list. Another movie I considered for my list was this surprisingly clever mystery thriller that airs as too close to kill in the UK. The plot is about the murder of a new sorority pledge and there are plenty of dodgy characters for prime suspects and Manfred to investigate. The obvious villain is a teaching assistant named Victor, simply because he isn't that obvious and no evidence points to him. However, instead it's a relatively obvious suspect, bitchy sorority head Jubilee, who turns out to be the real killer. There's an impressive narrative feint where it's implied the wife of a college professor is the murderess. The drama savvy heroine actually picks up on this and escapes after throwing hot tea in her face. Sadly, her instincts prove to be wrong and the real villainess presents herself soon after. How slow are you? You killed Chris? And that Tanya bitch. And that idiot Paul if only hurry up and die already. And now you. Why? Because Justin Miller is mine. <laughs> we only get around the brief confrontation before the villainess is arrested, but the above average resolution earns an honorable mention. Thanks. No! Kill you! It seems 2017 was a particularly good year for TV movie endings because we got a surprisingly exciting finale to this otherwise pedestrian thriller. The plot is about as generic as they come, a woman gets involved with someone with a dark and mysterious past only to find her life in danger. There's a drawn out stalk and slash scene at the beginning, before main character Chloe moves in next door to the suspicious Gerald Dixon. The heroine suffers from panic attacks, a plot device to ensure nobody will believe her later, and Gerald conveniently reveals he's a psychiatrist. Q inevitable warning signs, a shadowy stalker in Chloe's house, amateur detective work, near misses with a potentially psycho doctor, and a disposable secondary male character giving Chloe dirt on Gerald. The guy gets killed almost immediately after meeting Chloe with the usual backseat garrot MO. So far, so average, and you'd never suspect an exciting and violent finale was on the cards. After Chloe learns Gerald's wife Cheryl has mental health issues, it's time for the villainess to eliminate another woman she sees as a threat. This is a drawn out strangulation with multiple attempts that goes on for several minutes. Yes, minutes, not the usual five seconds.
The heroine wakes up in a chair, restrained and forced to endure Cheryl's insane ranting. Then, after the villainess and the slightly more sane Gerald have a violent off-screen difference of opinion, the murderess returns to finish Chloe off. Gerald always was a softie. Can you believe it, Chloe? <laughs> I mean, he actually wanted to let you live. <laughs> like you weren't going to tell anybody what you discovered. <laughs> That's just nuts. Did the producers forget this was a made-for-TV movie? Eventually, the husband comes to Chloe's rescue at the last minute. Continuing the theme of So So Lifetime movies with great endings, this thriller earns an honourable mention thanks to an intriguing premise and a decent twist that actually makes sense. An elaborate opening murder sets the tone when a woman follows a trail of red heart balloons and message cards only to find a mysterious assassin waiting at the end. Fast forward two years and businesswoman Sarah Miller might just be the next target. Sadly the expected killing spree never happens and the movie mainly focuses on Sarah's relationships and dull office politics. Characters in her life act weird just to create potential assassin candidates and suspects include a company rival and devoted assistant. Someone takes photographs of Sarah and plants listening devices in the house and it appears at first the assassin is an ex-cop named Vincent Stirrup after he leaves a mysterious package in a letterbox. However, appearances can be deceptive and ultimately it's revealed that Sarah is a hit woman and Vincent a good guy tracking her. Sarah? Well, this was going to happen inevitably. However unfortunate, covers are always discovered. I told you to stay away, honey. In retrospect, Sarah's odd behaviour, refusing to involve the police and caring more about a man's camera than the victim after an accident, all makes perfect sense. Scenes of her working out, handling firearms very capably and throwing darts with lethal accuracy will seem obvious hints on a repeat viewing. The female assassin gets to dish out a couple of martial arts beatdowns <laughs> Try, honey. Oh. I understand. I know you're upset. Okay, I promise to kill you last, all right? confrontation with the husband goes the obvious way when Sarah claims he doesn't have what it takes to squeeze the trigger. It's not until approximately the 60 minute mark that we're introduced to the real killer, a stranger that shows up at Jessica's house and introduces herself as Lisa Calders. I had an opportunity to read the police report you filed. There's no question in my mind that Marcus Declan is guilty. Yeah, but the police said they can't do anything because there's no evidence. True. That's why I'm here. A year ago, I represented Marcus Declan. Intelligent viewers may well peg Lisa as the villainess from the moment she walks on screen, given we've never seen a stalker's face, but Jessica and her husband Russell welcome Lisa with open arms and don't do the obvious background check until it's far too late. Lisa offers to help the couple trap Marcus, but suggests to keep the police out of it, a further clue something is off. A number of meetings take place between Lisa and Jessica, and it soon becomes obvious the villainess, we can stop pretending already, is drawing them into whatever scheme she's cooked up. Jessica escapes another attempt on her life, this time a hit and run by a masked driver.
Naturally, the police don't believe Jessica's claims and imply Russell is responsible, and so like all Lifetime movies, it's down to the couple to deal with everything themselves. The movie climaxes in a barn when Russell finally figuring out Lisa is an imposter races to Jessica's rescue. Her name isn't Lisa. Oops. Guess the cat is out of the bag. Dana, why are you doing this? Shut up, Marcus. Who are you? Tell them who I am. She's my wife. Mrs. Dana Declan. A fact that Marcus has conveniently forgotten so many times. It turns out the poor woman at the beginning of the film was another of Dana's victims. Interestingly, Juliet Lando is credited as Lisa Calder's or alias with no mention of her real name, probably to keep the reveal a surprise. However, the DVD cover gives the game away as it shows the female villain wearing black gloves and holding a pistol. No witnesses. No! Bye, Russell. No! Russell! Run! The final confrontation is suitably long, and with Marcus and Russell incapacitated, it's left to the two women to fight it out. Come on, Jessica, you know she's not going to be taken out that easily. It's rather easy to lose count of the number of improvised weapons used in this fight scene. And in the end, Jessica gets to put a martial arts training to good use. 